We're going to the word of the Lord, Luke chapter 2, verse 41. The last few weeks have just been felt, uh, just been feeling led to just kind of just go where the Lord was leading me in terms of uh, the preaching. No specific sermon series, but things that he's laid on my heart. Just been wanting to share those things with you. And we're going to Luke chapter 2, verse 41. Starting at verse 41, we're going to go through verse 49. I ask that you would stand for the reading of the word. Luke chapter 2, verses 41 through 49. I'm going to be reading from the New King James Version. King James Version will be on the screen. Hear the word of the Lord. His parents went to Jerusalem every year at the feast of the Passover. And when he was 12 years old, they went up to Jerusalem according to the custom of the feast. When they had finished the days as they returned, the boy Jesus lingered behind in Jerusalem, and Joseph and his mother did not know it. But supposing him to have been in the company, they went a day's journey and sought him among their relatives and acquaintances. Read verse 45 for me. Verse 46. Keep going. And mm -hmm. 48. So when they saw him, they were amazed. And his mother said to him, Son, why have you done this to us? Look, your father and I have sought you anxiously. And he said unto them, verse 49. Hey Amen. Two verses at once. That's all right. Good stuff. I want to talk to you today from these three words. Don't forget Jesus. Tell somebody, don't forget Jesus. Father God, I thank you today for this time and opportunity to open up the word of God, to teach and preach your words that bring life and transformation. I ask you now, Lord Jesus, that you would open up our hearts to receive what you would have us to hear. I pray, Lord, that we not just be hearers of the word, but doers as well. In Jesus Christ's name we pray. Thank God. Amen. Amen. Everybody can take your seat. Say it one more time. Don't, Don't forget, forget Jesus. You know, after several times of traveling out of town and forgetting stuff, you ever traveled and forgot stuff? Yep. I decided to make a list. Go figure, right? And so I got so serious about this list that I actually typed up a document that is my packing document. And whenever I get ready to travel, I pull up that document to make sure that I don't forget anything. Good to have Sister Akins with us today. God bless you, Sister Akins. Hey, man, I said, I'm not going to forget anything, so I'm going to get this list together and make sure I follow this list and check it off. Y'all got lists, all right? You got shopping lists. I said, I'm going to have a packing list. And so Holy Convocation is coming up, so you know I got my convocation packing list together. But here's one thing that I realized about the packing list is that you should not check off anything until you actually put it in the bag. See, because what I found out was I'd have on my list to carry this suit. I pulled a suit and put it on the bed and then check it off and then realized I didn't put it in the bag. Yeah, I really messed up last year. I went to the AIM convention, and I had my whole list together, but I didn't realize that the dry cleaners that I went to was closed on Sundays. Yeah, uh-huh. I went all the way to the convention with old clothes. <laughs> First world problems, right? Yeah, so I uh, had my list together, and okay, you got to put it in the bag. And it seems like even with the list, when I get to where I'm going, it's always some little thing I forget. Like, I got all my clothes, I got all my stuff, got all my everything, and then I leave a toothbrush. Or, you know, then I say, oh, okay, I got, I got my toothbrush, I got my toothpaste, I got this, but then I leave my charger. It's always something that ain't going to happen today. I got my list together. But there's always something you forget. Now, you may forget a toiletry item, you may forget a clothing item, but who travels and forgets their child? I mean, who forgets their child? 
like family vacation. Who we made it. We got everything. We got the clothes. We got the. Where's our child? Heard about one guy. He was a new father, and he was still getting used to being a father. And you know, pulled up to the restaurant to meet his wife and sister-in-law. Got there and went inside. Said, "Hey guys, how's it going?" They looked at him and said, uh, "Where's our son?" He's like, "Ugh, we do have a newborn, don't we?" Yeah. Don't don't forget your child. This is what happens in the passage today. Mary and Joseph, they're traveling. It's the Passover. They're going to and fro, and they realize a day later after they left the Passover that Jesus is nowhere to be found. They forgot Jesus. This is a very unique story, unique passage of Scripture uh, for a few reasons. Firstly, this is the only glimpse that we have into the childhood of Jesus Christ. The only glimpse that we have, of course, outside of his infancy and things of that nature, this is the only time we see him as a child. The only biblical inspired reference that we have to his childhood. Now, there's a lot of false stories that are out there about Jesus and other false gospels that talk about Jesus being a little kid and he had some clay and then he made it into a little bird and then it flew away. That's all false. This is the only story that we have on the life of Jesus Christ as a child. This story is unique also because it's the only time that we see the words of Jesus as a child recorded. We see his very first words. You know, you record your kids' first words. Dad, dad, mama. His first words were, didn't you know I have to be about my father's business, right? That's pretty amazing. If my kid came out the womb saying that, I'm like, huh, holy ghost, have your way. All right. <laughs> These are his, his first words that we see recorded in the scripture, and no doubt they are powerful words. Whenever you see something happen for the first time in the Bible, it gives us a glimpse into what God is trying to say or what he's trying to do. So this is the very first time we see Jesus talk, and the first words out of his mouth are, didn't you know that I need to be about my father's business? Setting the stage for his entire life, showing us that he came to do his father's business. Lastly, this is the only time, or this is the last time, rather, that we see Joseph mentioned in the life of Jesus. The very last time, we don't see any more mention of Joseph in the Bible. And I think that's intriguing, because Joseph was Jesus' earthly father or his stepfather. But the day that Jesus declares, I've got to be about my father's business, is as if there was a shift that happened. It's as if Jesus has come into his manhood and he's saying, I know why I'm here. Joseph, you did your job. We, we bless you. We thank God for you. But I've got a heavenly father whose business I need to be about. And so the story starts off. It's the Passover. And as their custom was, Mary and Joseph always went to Jerusalem for the Passover. Now, the Passover was a celebration or a feast that God instituted to commemorate how he passed over the houses of the children of Israel and went to the Egyptian homes and killed the firstborn. He told Moses many years prior that you should kill a lamb, a firstborn lamb, without blemish, without defect, and take the blood of that lamb, smear it on the doorposts and smear it on top of the doors, and it will be that when I see the blood, I'll pass over. That's where they got the old song from, when I see the blood, I will pass, I will pass over you. He says, I'm going to pass over. And it was a foreshadow of Jesus Christ because Jesus Christ is the firstborn. He is the only begotten of the father. He is the lamb without sin, without defect, without blemish, without deception, without lies, without guile found in his mouth, the Bible says. And it was his blood that's when it's applied to our lives. God no longer sees us, but he passes over our sins and he passes over our debts and he does not count it against us, but counts it against his son. Aren't you glad that God has passed over you? Amen. Amen. The blood of Jesus Christ saves us from sin. And so here it is at the Passover, the Passover feast that Jesus goes with his parents. And he goes with his parents and he's there for the celebration. It's about a week long celebration and they're celebrating, they're feasting, they're, they're eating and what have you. And then they're going back home. But on their way back home, they realize Jesus Christ is not with them. Bible says they supposed that he was with the kinfolk. He was with the caravan that they were traveling with, but didn't find him. And it took them three days. And when they search for him three days on that third day, they find him in the temple. And he's sitting with the doctors of the law or those who are the teachers, the rabbis. He's sitting with them and he's listening to them and he's asking them questions. And they're astonished by what he's saying and what he's asking. And his own parents were amazed. Your children ever amazed you? They're just amazed. And what Jesus is saying and doing. And so Mary gets a little attitude as a mother would if the child was not around. It says, Jesus, why have you done this to us? Can you imagine getting an attitude with God? 
why have you done this to us? We've been searching frantically for you. We've been, been looking all over for you. And why, why would you do this to us? We've been looking for you. And Jesus says, how is it that you were looking for me? Didn't you know that I would be about my father's business? Well, the, the thing that I want to really focus on today is how you lose fellowship with Jesus. How you can be in relationship with Jesus and yet not have consistent fellowship with Jesus. Now, you may say, now, that's kind of strange. I mean, I'm saved. I mean, if I'm saved, then I'm good. You know, I got fellowship with Jesus. Well, I've come to realize that you can have relationship and yet not have consistent fellowship. You say, well, how is that possible? I mean, just look at it in the natural. And how many of you all have a family member that you never talk to? Right? You're related, right? You got relationship. They're your brother, they're your sister, they're your cousin, they're your mom, they're your father, but you don't have fellowship. Some people, not you, but somebody you know, you know, they're married and they live in the same house and they sleep in the same bed, but they don't have fellowship. They're more so roommates than they are fellowship partners. Reminds me of a story I heard my grandfather tell. I'm taking all his jokes. I'm sorry, all of his humorous stories. About the man who was celebrating his 50th wedding anniversary. Celebrates his anniversary, and the young people are sitting around him, and they say, man, that's amazing, 50 years. You know, I, I, what, what, did you, what did you do for your 25th anniversary? Oh, I took my wife to Hong Kong. I said, wow, well, what are you going to do for your 50th? I'm going to go back, and I'm going to get her. <laughs> right? So some people, they survive because they have no fellowship. Right? They, <laughs> no fellowship. You know? So you can be in relationship with Jesus and yet not have fellowship with Jesus. Now you say, well, pastor, I need you to uh, kind of show me some scripture. Well, I'm glad that you asked for some word because we're a word church and we preach the Bible. Go to Revelation chapter 3, verse 20. Revelation chapter 3, verse 20. In those first three chapters, we see Jesus talking to seven churches. And so Jesus is now talking to a church at Laodicea. Say Laodicea. Laodicea. He tells this church at Laodicea, he says, I got an issue with you. My issue with you is that you are neither hot nor cold, but you are lukewarm. And he's making this comparison to water. Now, I can work with hot water. I can make some tea with hot water. I can cook some stuff with hot water. I can take a shower with hot water. I can work with cold water. I can drink it. I can be refreshed by it, but I can't do nothing with lukewarm water. He's saying here that you're lukewarm. You're neither hot nor cold. And because you're lukewarm, I'm going to spew you out of my mouth. And what he's showing them here is here is a church that was in relationship with Jesus, but yet they're, they're negligent in their fellowship with God. They begin to compromise. They begin to step back. They begin to lose their fervor, lose their passion for God. And here's what Jesus says to them in Revelation chapter 3, verse 20. Behold, I stand at the door and knock. If any man hear my voice and open the door, I will come in to him and will sup with him. That's fellowship and he with me. He's saying, hey, you're having church, but I'm not there. You're having church, but I'm on the outside. Do you know there's some folk having church and God ain't nowhere in there. And if you don't get it together and establish that connection of fellowship, you'll eventually fall out of relationship with God. See, you can have gotten saved and walking with Jesus and talking with Jesus, but then get so derelict in your responsibilities and so deficient in your relationship that you just completely forget God. I don't want to be one that's got relationship with God and God's not included in my daily life. Well, what does that look like in the life of the believer? It's, it's the person who they were walking with God and talking with God, but, but yet they just kind of stopped praying. They just kind of stopped reading their word. He said, oh, well, you know, I can, I can skip today. You know, we kind of treat our relationship with God like we do the gym. You know what I'm saying? I'll go next week, right? You know, I'll just, give me two weeks and I'll get started. Well, you can't do that with your relationship with God. Amen. You don't take a vacation from fellowship with God. You may miss a church service, but don't miss time with God. Amen. So what do we do in this time that we find ourselves falling out of relationship with God? How do, how do, we, how do we see ourselves forgetting Jesus. What well, is the first thing that I want to give you in your notes here? Is that loss of fellowship with Jesus is a slow fade. It's a slow fade. In other words, it doesn't happen all at once. It happens gradually. Look at what's happening with Mary and Joseph. Here they are traveling in a caravan. They're traveling in a large group, going back to their homeland. And while they're going back to their homeland, they, they, they do it a step at a time. 
one step at a time. A few inches turn into a few yards. A few yards turn into a few miles until they figure out that Jesus is not with me. You see, a slow fade in your fellowship with God means that it doesn't happen all at once, but it's gradual, small compromises, little foxes, a little leaven. And before you know it, you find yourself distant from God, from the God that you used to find yourself such in relationship with. And I think about how that happens with us sometimes. Sometimes we're so blinded by our journey. We're so blinded and so consumed that we miss the subtleties in our changes in our relationship with God. We're so consumed that we don't even realize that God is gone, that he's knocking at the door. It's kind of like Samson, who had this head full of hair and had the supernatural strength from God. But when he shared his secret with Delilah, she took that secret and exposed him, cut his hair and bound him. with. And when he woke up, he did not realize that the spirit of God had left him. It was a slow fade. You say, well, he cut his hair and then everything was gone, but it started slowly. See, it started with slow compromises. We see how Samson was at one point in his walk with God and he was touching dead things. It says that he, there was a lion that was dead and there was a honeycomb inside the lion and he goes and touches that dead lion and takes the honey out and eats it, which shows that he was violating his relationship with God. He's violating because he was not to touch any unclean thing. He had an oath before God, and he could not cut his hair. So he violates it with the dead lion. But then it also says that Samson was walking through a vineyard, walking through a field, which may seem like something so subtle, but because of his vow to God, he could not drink any of the fruit of grapes. But here he is walking through the vineyard. Slow faith, slow compromises, a little thing here, a little thing there. And before he knows it, he's compromised so much, spent time with people he should not be with, and finds himself with his hair shaved and the Spirit of God gone. It's always little things. This is why the Bible says in Ephesians 4, 27, neither give place to the devil. Don't give a foothold to the devil. Because the moment you give him an inch, he's going to want to take a mile. They said, don't let the devil ride, because if you let him ride, he going to want to drive. That would be a good men's day song, right? Don't, don't let him ride. Because if you give him a little bit of space, he is going to infiltrate and increase his influence. He's going to increase his control. So you can't give any place to the devil. See, it's a slow fade. It's like the helium in the balloon. The balloon is floating and it's in the air. But day by day, the helium sleeps out, seeps out little by little until it's no longer floating. It's no longer rising. There's a group called Casting Crowns. They wrote a song called... It's a slow fade. The words say it's a slow fade when you give yourself away. It's a slow fade when black and white are turned to gray. And thoughts invade, choices are made, a price will be paid. When you give yourself away, people never crumble in a day. It's a slow fade. It's a slow fade. Second thing that we see about losing fellowship with Jesus is that religious practice is not a substitute for fellowship with God. Religious practice is not a substitute for fellowship with God. Look at where they're at. Mary and Joseph are on their way to the Passover. It's a religious festival. It's a celebration. All the church folks came together. It's a holy convocation. Here they are, a week-long celebration. They're sacrificing, they're eating, they're dancing, they're singing, they're doing all of these great things all in the name of God, but yet they forget God. You would think that the people who were religious would have remembered Jesus. This shows us that you can have all the religiosity that you want and God be nowhere around. I'm looking forward to convocation. It's going to be great. If you've never been, I encourage you to go. Thousands of people gathered together and worshiping. But can I let you know something? Holy convocation does not mean you got relationship with God. It doesn't mean you have fellowship with God. Because there's going to be tons of people there. There are going to be people decked out. They're going to look real saved. They're going to look real religious. They're going to have their suits on. Me too. I'm going to have my brand new suit. I got e Listen, I got an email the other day. I got an email about, from one of the department heads for the Church of God in Christ. And it said, give me a call. And I'm wondering... What do they want with me? Little, you know, kill him. So I see, I see it. I saw the name, and I'm just like, 
oh my goodness. So I called a number and I get the voicemail. So I called it again and again. I only did it three times. I stopped. Okay, I stopped. <laughs> Email me. So I called. All right, so I get a call back, but I was up preaching, so I couldn't answer the phone. Check the voicemail. And it's this is evangelist so-and-so calling from the office of uh, general board member Bishop Daryl Hines, and you've been selected to participate in holy convocation. I said, oh my goodness. I'm like, do they want me to sing? Do they? <laughs> Don't rate me, Faso. I'm like, let me. They want me to pray. Oh my God. I'm preaching that convocation. So all these thoughts are going through my head. I'm like, oh my goodness. He said, you've been selected to read the Old Testament scripture at the Saturday service. Now, that ain't preaching. It ain't singing. But I said, I'm going to read that scripture. But buy me a new suit. Buy me a new Bible. I'm going to practice like it's an Easter speech. Open up your Bibles to page 100 of your Centennial Bible. Hear the word of the Lord. All smiles, just cheesing at the Holy Convocation. Mama, I made it. Okay, I'm just, okay. Okay. So, but do you know you can have the look of religiosity? You can be at all the conferences. You can be busy for God and yet not be spending time with God. Don't confuse your church attendance with personal time with God. Yeah, don't forsake the assembling of yourselves together. Come to church. Yes, this is part of your walk with God. There's nothing wrong with the religious display, but the religious display must take a knee to the priority, which is private time with God. See, religion in and of itself, is not bad. It's not. There's good religion, and there's bad religion. The, the Bible talks about good religion. Yeah, I'm religious. I, I can't get with the, you religious, but you ain't got relationship. No, there's nothing wrong with being religious, because there needs to be some external show of your inward work. But the external show starts with the inward work. So all of this that I do, coming to church, going to choir rehearsal, being on the usher board, being in the nurses guild, videotaping the services, whatever it is that I'm doing in church is because of my personal relationship with God. So you have to get fellowship with God first, then do the religious stuff, not do the religious stuff and neglect the personal relationship. Tell somebody there's a priority to this thing. So your religious practice by itself is not a substitute for fellowship with God. Amen. Next thing here is that fellowship with God is my responsibility. Fellowship with God is my responsibility. It's not yours. It's not mama's. It's not daddy's. It's not the pastor's. It's your responsibility. My fellowship with God is my responsibility. Look at verse 44. But they supposing him to have been in the company went a day's journey and they sought him amongst their kinsfolk and acquaintance. It was an assumption. They supposed, they assumed that Jesus was with somebody else. So they didn't check and realized that they had forgot God. Amen. What is he showing us here? That you can depend on other people concerning your relationship with God. It's, it's such a cop-out to point to your deficiencies as somebody else's fault. I would spend time with God, but so-and-so. It's like, no, any, anytime there's a, there's a but, right? You, you, know, you need to figure out what is it that you're doing? What is it that I'm doing that's causing me not to have the walk with God that I desire? You can't depend on other people for your walk with God. As a matter of fact, you can't live vicariously through others and think that that's going to do something for your walk. We get amazed looking at other folk. Look at how God is using them. Wow, look at their prayer life. And we think we're safe because they got it good. No, you got to get this thing for yourself. For yourself. Philippians 2 verse 12. Here's what it says, wherefore, my beloved, as you have always obeyed, not as in my presence only, but now much more in my absence, work out. Oh, you got to say this with me. Work 
out your own salvation with fear and trembling. Work out your own salvation. Not my neighbor's salvation. Not, not, not the person around the street salvation. No, but work out your own salvation. Let me tell you something. When you get busy working out your salvation, you won't have time to be trying to work out someone else's. Some people thrive on gossip. They, they, they thrive on what they heard and don't even know if it's true. But tell somebody, you got to work out your responsibility, your salvation. You got to work out your own salvation with fear and trembling. You need to be showing in your own life that you're demonstrating fruits of repentance, that you're showing that I'm really walking with God, that I'm doing this thing with God, with my own life. Some people, they thrive off of other people's business. And, and Paul said that there are some of you who are busybodies. He said you're busybodies meddling in other people's affairs. Something you thought you heard, something you thought you saw. I want to let you know that all of us got enough stuff that we can work on for ourselves. And if everybody's working on themselves, everybody will be worked on. Come on, God. Come on. Come on. Tony wrote a song, Work On Me. Yeah. <laughs> work out your own soul salvation. Next thing we need to do to guard against forgetting Jesus, consistency in fellowship. Guards against loss of fellowship. Consistency in fellowship. Andre Crouch wrote a song, Andre Crouch. He says, always remember Jesus. Always keep him on your mind. Always remember him. If you're always remembering him, always acknowledging him, always keeping him on your mind, you will guard against losing fellowship with him. You lose fellowship with the folk that you don't communicate with. Consistency is what God is calling for. Now, how could they have kept from losing Jesus if they had check-ins? If, if, if they were checking in and making sure he was good, if they were checking in and making sure he was all right, if they checked in and made sure before they left that he was there. Tell somebody you need to make some check-ins. You need to get a check-in before you get your day started. You need to check in with God. In the middle of your day, you need to check in with God while you're riding in your car. You need to check in with God before you go to sleep. Don't go throughout your day and not check in with the one who made your day possible. Check in with him. Open up your word. Pray. I, I would encourage you to make it a responsibility that when you wake up, before you do anything else, that you pray. That you thank God for that day. That before you go to sleep. And instead of letting the TV rock you to sleep, instead of letting the cell phone rock you to sleep, if you would intentionally say, I'm going to read a scripture, that's going to be the last thing that I do before I go to sleep. When you have check-ins with God, your walk and your fellowship with God is going to increase. Got to have consistent time with God. I was told that, that oh, your, your, your walk with God, your relationship with God is not a run, but it's a walk. It's, it's not a sprint. It's a marathon. It's not magic. It's agriculture. It's day by day. It's one step at a time. See, don't worry about who else has a, a higher pace or a, a deeper depth in their relationship with God. You just grow from where you are. You just start right where you are. Because the enemy will try to trick you and make you think that because you haven't done what was right in the past. or I mean, some of you feel convicted right now, and that's good. That's conviction of the Holy Spirit. But turn that conviction into action. Don't, don't go home and say, well, I feel so guilty. I might as well not even come. I might as well not even start because I'm so far behind. You know, I ain't been to, you know, it's amazing, you know, when I talk to somebody outside of church, and I don't even really bring up church. I'll, I'll just mention that I'm a minister or a pastor, and they, they just start confessing, like, all their faults. They just... <laughs> And I told you about when I was at the Burger King line and I had my clergy collar on. I forgot I had it on. And then I pulled up and got my, my, my meal. And the lady said, you know, I ain't been to church in so long. And I need it today. I really need prayer, especially after last night. I'm just like, oh. And I'm like, why is she spilling her guts? And I said, oh, <laughs> it's the clergy collar. I get it. I get it. I get it. You know, you ask somebody where they go to church. Oh, Pentecostal temple. Really? I go to Pentecostal temple. Well, it's, you know, it's been a while. When we was on the, it's been a while. Well, so much been happening. And it's like they instantly like get guilty. I'm like, yo, I don't care where you've been. Just start today. It's a new day. It's a new day. Come back fresh. So here's the, here's the last thing you need to do. You lose fellowship with God. Here's what you need to do. Go back to Jesus and restore fellowship. 
Go back. Go back to your first love. Go back to the altar. Down on your knees. Right? Just, here's, y'all might as well finish the song. Tell you to get the Holy Ghost. Okay, all right. Y'all don't help me preach today. Just kidding. Go back. What did Mary and Joseph do? After they were gone for a day, they went back. When they realized that Jesus was gone, they didn't sit there and say, oh, my God, I'm such a bad parent. Like, I can't believe I left them. It's like, listen, get up and go back. Because you can sit there and beat yourself up about what you didn't do, what you could have did, what you should have did, and all of those things. But you can't change the past, so you might as well start a new start. You, you might as well look forward to a glorious future. And so they turn and they go back to where he was. And some of you can remember how you were. You can, you can look back to a point in your life where you say, I was a little more fervent in my prayer. I was a little more dedicated. I was, I was a little more consistent. Listen, you can get that back right now. You can be consistent right now and just say, today I'm going to pray. Before I eat, I'm going to pray. But when I wake up, I'm going to pray. When I go to bed, I'm going to pray. I'm going to say a scripture. I'm going to get in the word. I'm not going to neglect my relationship with God. I'm not going to make excuses for why I can't spend time with God because you've got 24 hours in a day. Just go back. Amen. Start all over again. Do your first works again. Go back and seek God. And when you start seeking God, God gives us a promise. He says that if you seek me, you will find me when you search for me with your whole heart. This is what they do. Verse 46, it came to pass that after three days, they found him in the temple. They were searching and they found him. They were, they were going back to where they last had them, and they picked back up where they started. They go back. I, I love the timeline. It says that they found him on the third day in the temple. Tell somebody they found him on the third day in the temple. Isn't this a glorious glimpse into the gospel of Jesus Christ? How we lost Jesus on a Friday. Jesus was isolated. It says, smite the shepherd and the sheep will scatter. Everybody scattered and forgot Jesus. And there Jesus dies on a cross between two thieves, alone, with his father's back turned towards him, just like Joseph's back was turned towards him. And he dies. And then the third day he gets up. But they don't find him in a temple because he now is the temple. He said, destroy this temple. And in three days, I will raise it up. So here they find Jesus after three days. Peter denied him. Judas betrayed him. Thomas doubted him. All neglected him. But then Jesus rose again. And he was seen, it says, by 500 people. It says that those who were dead got up. They went to the tomb looking for Jesus, and the angel said, why are you looking for the living among the dead? He said, he's alive. He has risen just as he said. They found him on the third day. I want to let you know that today is your third day. Today is your day of do-over. Today is your day of resurrection. Today is your day of revival. Today is your day of revitalization. Today is your day of being done with the old and done with the old way of life and done with how stuff used to be and how you used to do things and starting all over and starting afresh. It's a brand new start. You can reignite your fellowship with God today. The, the apostles prayed that we would have the fellowship of the Holy Spirit. Sweet communion with God. You can have that today, and you don't have to wait to get it. 
You don't have to be at a particular place to get fellowship with God. You can turn your car into sanctuary. You can turn your bedroom into sanctuary. You can turn your living room into sanctuary. You can turn the sink while you're washing dishes into sanctuary and maximize this time and get back your fellowship with God. Next time you're walking on a treadmill, don't just walk on a treadmill, but walk and pray. That's probably one of my favorite things to do is to walk and pray. Especially with the weather being hot, I just go outside and just walk and just talk to the Lord. I go to the gym and I'm on the treadmill and I put my phone right there and I'm reading the scriptures while I'm walking. I say, you know what? I'm not going to waste my time. I'm going to maximize my time and take back my fellowship with God. Listen, I don't know who's here today, but I know there's somebody who heard this and you say, I know that I need to rekindle my fellowship with God. I know I've been busy with stuff, been busy with good stuff, been busy with conferences, been busy with conventions, been busy with services, been busy with meetings, been busy with rehearsals, been busy with this stuff, but God, I need some one-on-one time with you. I need some time, God, where it's, it's just me and you, N- not, nothing else. No, no, no phone calls, no text messages, no Facebook. No, no, it's my face in the book. It's my time with God. I got it from Ann Fields. I can't take credit. I got it from her. I did. Listen, when our head's bowed and eyes closed, if that's you today, and you say, I want to rekindle my fellowship with God. I'm saved, but, but I want to go deeper. If that's you, just raise that hand. Say, I want to go deeper. I want to go deeper too. Lord God, your word says that deep cries out to deep. Lord, I thank you that you're calling us deeper into you. Deeper in the love of God. Deeper in fellowship with you. Deeper in our revelation of the word. God, I thank you that we're going deeper. We're getting roots. Father God, I pray for those that raise their hands today. God, who want increased fellowship with you. I pray, Lord, that you would meet them. I pray, God, that when they sit to talk with you, that when they set a time to pray, that when they come before you, Lord God, that you would meet them there and give them blessed, sweet communion, blessed fellowship, Lord God. I pray that you begin to grow them so that those who are around them will see a difference in their life. I pray, God, that they would even see a difference in their own life, that they would see their attitudes change, that they would see their actions change, that they would see doubts and anxieties leaving their lives because they're getting a greater dose of fellowship with you. God, I thank you for it. In Jesus' name. There may be some people here today, you don't have a relationship with Jesus at all. You have zero fellowship with God. You've yet to make Jesus Christ your Lord and Savior. Today is the day of salvation. Today is the day of salvation. And with everyone standing, I want to pray for those that may not be believers in Jesus Christ. You say, today I want to give my life to Jesus. Today I want to be his child. If that's you today, would you just come and meet us up here at the altar? You say, I want to give my life to Jesus Christ today. I want to start fresh. I want to start all over. You can pray a simple prayer and God will do it for you. Just say, Lord Jesus, forgive me for the wrong I've been and the wrong I've done. I want to be saved. I believe you died for me and rose again. So come into my heart and be the Lord of my life. And if you prayed that prayer in faith and you prayed to believe me, my friend, you are saved and have started fellowship with Jesus Christ. Hallelujah. If you desire prayer for anything today, I don't care what it's for. You can come right now. We're going to pray with you. We're going to pray for you. If you don't have a church home, this is a great church, Pentecostal Temple. Amen.